This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Primates come in different shapes and sizes. They share um, several things in common. One of them is the fact that they have a larger brain for their body size. <coughs> Great apes and some other primates are known to be very skillful when it comes to exploring their natural environment. Primates are also known to live in very complex social environments. Based on that, it has been suggested that sociality may be a driving force in increases of primate brain size and also behind human cognitive complexity. The social environment is dynamic. There is learning and understanding of rules that's involved, political behaviors, alliances, deceptions. We all know about that. <laughs> social complexity um, has been viewed uh, in the context of group size or network size and has been uh, related to increases in brain size or increases in parts of the brain, like the neocortex. The question for us who study the brain is, in addition to the increase in absolute size, what is it in the neural circuitry that underlies social behavior that may have changed during human evolution? We have known for a long time that selected brain regions receive and process emotion-related signals. We have known that from work on experimental animals and also more recently with advances of non-invasive imaging techniques from the work of, on humans. What we have not known for a long time and what's a relatively new idea and quite revolutionary is the idea that if these brain regions are damaged, like uh, it was the case with Phineas Gage, then we have changes in our ability also to make advantageous decisions in personal, social, and financial domains. We know about this from an accumulating uh, body of data that comes from so-called lesion studies and also imaging studies. What we have on the board is an example of a brain that was lesioned in ways similar to that of Phineas Gage, with a lot of damage on the ventromedial and orbital prefrontal cortex. So what is the neuroanatomy behind social cognition? There have been several areas that have been proposed as critical, areas that are interconnected, and if damaged, compromise social cognition. Some of the major areas are uh, listed on the board. They include the insula, Broca's area, and large parts of the prefrontal cortex, including the orbital cortex and the, the ventromedial cortex. They also include the anterior cingulate and the amygdala. Now, social cognition, so the ability to properly interact in a social context, is compromised in uh, selected neurodevelopmental disorders, included autism, including autism. In autism, what we know about the brain of individuals who, who uh, have the disorder is that early in life, we have an overgrowth in brain size. So early in childhood, there is an overgrowth of the brain with a possible decline later in life. Now, this overgrowth does not happen homogeneously across the brain. It affects some areas more than others. Some of the areas affected, some of the areas behind this early overgrowth are the frontal lobe and to some extent the temporal lobe and the cerebellum, while other areas are compromised or affected in different ways, like the amygdala. We know that the amygdala, and specifically the, the lateral nucleus of the amygdala, which is a subnucleus within this structure, 
has numbers of neurons that are reduced in autistic adults. And you can see um, that data in red up here. Now, Williams syndrome is another disorder of interest in the context of social cognition. It is, it's a syndrome that's less known to the general public in comparison to autism, but um, it is caused by hemizygous deletion of about 25 genes in chromosome 7, uh, and that creates several physical, cognitive, behavioral, affective, and neurobiological aberrations. One thing that stands out in Williams syndrome individuals and that is of interest to my talk today is the fact that Williams syndrome people are, have aspects of their social cognition especially enhanced. What you see on the chart here is different measures of sociability that compare Williams syndrome to typically developing <coughs> controls, Down syndrome, and autistic individuals. And as you can see, in all measures, they measure higher. Now, the overall brain volume in Williams syndrome is reduced, gray matter by about 11%, white matter by about 18%. And just like we saw with autism, uh, what happens with Williams syndrome is that uh, the reduction does not affect the brain in a homogeneous way. It affects different parts of the brain in different ways. Once again, the frontal lobe and the amygdala stand out as being enhanced in Williams syndrome. Uh, we plan in collaboration with Ursula Bellucci and the team that she assembled to look into Williams syndrome brains and try to explain what is it in the underlying circuitry <coughs> that makes these brains slightly different than the other um, controls. So what is the comparative neuroanatomy of the social brain circuitry that um, I, will be, I will be reviewing? I'm going to be showing you some data. Uh, the distribution of gray to white matter, microscopic features of gray matter, including the distribution of areas within the gray matter, the density of neurons, the morphology of neurons, and finally, molecular makeup of specific uh, cell populations. So these are the directions in which my lab had been working and is planning to work in the immediate future. Um, it has been shown that the size of a neural region is related to its functional significance in mammals. So animals like mice that rely heavily on tactile input from whiskers have an enlarged sensory cortex. The ghost bat, a collocation, enlarged auditory cortex. The opossum, highly visual, enlarged visual cortex. In that spirit, it has been argued for a long time that the prefrontal cortex in the human brain, because it is involved and critical for so many complex cognitive functions, may have been differentially enlarged in humans as opposed to other primates. We looked at, into individual cortical areas within the prefrontal cortex, into some of them, and we found that although the entire frontal lobe as a whole, the entire frontal <coughs> cortex as a whole, is not differentially enlarged in humans when compared to the other apes, individual cortical areas within the prefrontal cortex uh, vary in size. So some frontal cortex areas are relatively larger, while others are smaller. This means that the distribution of areas in the gray matter differs. How about connectivity? There are local connections and there are long-range connections in the human and primate brains. A few years ago, we looked into some measures of local connectivity using structural MRIs and compared the amount of white matter that represents local connections against the amount of white matter that reflects wrong range connections. What we found is that in the case of the human brain, when compared to the great apes, the local connections, the white matter underlying uh, the gyri is actually increased. And we found that both in the frontal lobe and in the temporal lobe as well. So human brains have different distribution of white matter with increased local connectivity. How about the amygdala? The amygdala, you can see a cross-section here through the human brain. 
The amygdala are composed of several subnuclei that are selectively interconnected with other parts of the brain. This is a complex diagram um, that shows the basal lateral uh, set of nuclei that are interconnected specifically with the isocortex, or as most of us uh, refer to it, neocortex, <coughs> while other parts of the amygdala are connected to other structures or factory centers or the brainstem of the nervous system. Now, in collaboration with Lisa Stefanacci, my student Nicole Barger in my lab did an extensive, detailed uh, analysis of the amygdala across humans and great apes. We know that the lateral nucleus is highly interconnected with specifically the temporal lobe cortex. What Nicole found is that the lateral nucleus is also differentially enlarged in humans when compared to the great apes, a finding that we did not have in any of the other parameters of the amygdala that we looked at. From previous studies that we had done using, again, MRI images, we had found that the temporal lobe is enlarged in humans as compared to the great apes. So unlike what we saw with the frontal, it is actually the temporal that seems to be larger. Now, this is of interest and raises a question on whether the argument that maybe evolution in the brain happens in the form of evolution of, of neural systems as opposed to individual structures has actually some validity and interest in this work pursuing further, and we plan to pursue this further. Another uh, data set that um, sort of reinforces this argument in a way has to do with the orangutans. Um, several years ago, I had looked um, through MRI scans into the anatomy of the orbitofrontal cortex, and what I found, and later on joined by my student, Natalie Schenker, is that the orbitofrontal cortex in orangutans is actually smaller. It stands out. Nicole, who was looking at the amygdala, identified that the basolateral part of the amygdala is also significantly smaller in orangutans in contrast to what we see in other, in other apes. So these two structures that are selectively interconnected seem to be smaller in this species of great ape. Orangutans are known to be solitary, probably the most solitary of all anthropoids. They react less impulsively to food than chimpanzees. And of course, that may have something to do with the fact that there is less competition for resources, which also is related possibly to the reduced size of their social groups. So again, an interesting uh, uh, line with respect to the argument of the evolution of neural systems possibly. Now, density of neurons. We have known for a while uh, that bigger brains have more neurons, of course, but they also have decreased density in their neurons. And that the increase of the cortical sheet happens mostly in a horizontal dimension as opposed to in depth. What happens is that early in development, cells migrate to their positions in vertical arrays. So more vertical arrays, or mini columns, <laughs> as some refer to them, means more cortical surface and increased convolutions. In collaboration with Dan Baxhoveden, we hypothesized that humans would have larger mini columns or larger spacing between the neurons when compared to great apes. So the question we asked is, is the spacing of the neurons and does the size of mini columns predicted by overall brain size? And is the spacing the same among cortical areas within each brain? Kate Teffer, another student of mine, and I and Dan Baxhoven worked on this, on this question. And we sampled from the primary visual, primary somatosensory, motor, cortex, and then also from the prefrontal cortex, specifically area 10. Uh, this is a busy graph, and I want you only to focus on a couple of things for the purpose of this talk. The, uh, the unit here is microns, and in absolute terms, as you can see, actually the different species do not vary considerably when compared amongst themselves. So the given who is about 100 grams big, the mini columns in this animal are not considerably smaller than what we see in the human brain where we have 1300 grams or more of brain weight. 
But where we see the difference is in the prefrontal cortex. So humans have more space between neural bodies than apes in the prefrontal cortex, and not as much in other parts of the brain. So the, question to the, the answer to the first question is no. And no is the answer to the, se the second question as well. This is a hypothetical reconstruction that we did on the evolution of at least these parameters in the prefrontal cortex. And what we suggest is that the prefrontal cortex changes took, places, took place after the last common ancestor with the chimpanzees. Now, what is the neurobiological significance of having increased phasing between neuronal bodies? Is the development in the prefrontal cortex different uh, in humans versus chimpanzees? Are there differences in branching morphology of neurons? What you see on the right is a picture of two pyramidal neurons and their entire dendritic trees. So if the difference between the cell bodies is larger, does this mean that we have increased arborization and that increased potential between neurons to talk to each other? There is a lot of work that has already been done on human tissue and also non-ape uh, smaller primate tissue that comes from other laboratories. But we're exploring this line of work in collaboration with Chet Sherwood, uh, Sherwood um, on the development and the morphology to see if uh, apes and humans differ. The microcircuitry, is it altered in syndromes that affect aspects of social behavior? What we have here is a dendrite, so a, an arbor coming out of a neuronal body, and the spines that allow neurons again to communicate. Recently, uh, Carol Marchetto in Rusty Gage's lab have shown that human red syndrome cultured neurons have reduced number of synapses and dendrite spines compared to non-affected controls. The question for us now is, are synapses and spines enhanced in the social brain circuitry in Williams syndrome? And we plan to pursue this question in collaboration with this group and Alison Mortry and Ursula Bellucci. What is the molecular signature underlying differences in branching morphology of neurons? We have been capturing neurons from specific anatomical regions of the social brain circuitry in humans and apes in order to compare expression profiles of microRNAs using deep sequencing and bioinformatics analysis. Again, we're doing this in collaboration with Allison and Rusty Gage's group. From the fossil record, we have some information of interest to the evolution of the social brain. Some Australopithecines have distinct features in the frontal and temporal lobes that place them closer to humans than to apes or other extinct hominids. One of those Australopithecines is the recently described a uh, sediba. The orbitofrontal cortex in this endocast is organized in ways that are more similar to the human orbitofrontal cortex than to that of the apes. I don't have time to go into the details. Um, I would like to close by saying that um, we have known that brain regions that receive and process emotion-related signals are critical for decision-making. This is a new idea. And this goes in contrast to the idea that has been very powerful for a long time, that the brain is organized in these simple three layers with a primitive brain in the middle, this completely freaked out woman in the, in the center, and the rational brain on the top right. It follows the idea of the triumph brain that places a focus on the cortex, and some call it now a corticocentric myopia. Uh, other structures in addition to the cortex need to be emphasized, and the evolution of the brain can no longer be viewed in the context of an orthogenetic ladder that leads to the perfection of the human brain. There are many more things that are going on. I would like to close with this slide and say that to me, human social brain evolution can be viewed as a dynamic mosaic, like the one you have on the left. Uh, it involves, in addition to increases in brain size, also alterations in the brain circuitry, including the social limbic brain. This is not a new idea, but now we start having the data to support it. And I would like to thank collaborators, my laboratory, and a special thanks to all the veterinarians across the US zoos that have been providing us with post-mortem 
non-invasively uh, a material. Thank you.